Hello and welcome to the Global Antitrust Institute's online lecture series. My name is Murat Mungan and in this class, in this lecture, we're going to be talking about perfect competition and monopolies. Our objective in this lecture uh, is to look at the most commonly studied models of firm behavior, namely perfect competition and monopolistic behavior. One of the most important reasons for why we look at these two cases is that they study how firms behave when they find themselves in the, in the two opposite ends of a spectrum of possible market conditions. Specifically, uh, in the perfect competition case, uh, we have a firm uh, who basically has zero control over anything that happens in the market. And in a monopoly case, uh, we have a single firm who controls all the production decisions in the market. Uh, so let's start by talking about uh, the perfect competition case first. Uh, and uh, we'll do this first by talking about uh, the conditions that must be met uh, for a market to be uh, perfectly competitive. Uh, first, uh, in a perfectly competitive market, the products offered by the firms need to be homogenous. What we mean by this is that each firm's product must be interchangeable with the other firm's products, uh, such that buyers have no preferences whatsoever over buying the product from one firm versus another. This uh, we formalize by saying that the goods are homogenous. Uh, that is to say, they have no variation across the products that are being in the market. The second condition um, is that in a perfectly competitive market, firms can freely enter and exit the market. This means that there are no barriers to entry, which in turn implies that whenever a potential entrant receives profitable, uh, receives a profit in the market, uh, it will enter it and start operating. The third condition is that buyers are, and sellers are well informed about prices. Uh, this basically implies that um, if there are two firms selling the product at different prices, uh, the buyer will go immediately to the one that's uh, offering the uh, product at a lower price because as we noted, uh, our first assumption of homogenous goods implies that, the, implies that the buyer has no preferences between the two products, and therefore will go to uh, the, the firm that's offering it at the cheapest rate. And finally, uh, and fourth, in a perfectly competitive market, there are many buyers and sellers, which implies that firms are price takers. This last point uh, that uh, firms must be price takers when there are many buyers and sellers in a perfectly competitive market um, is worth highlighting more because it's not immediately clear to everyone why this must be the case. So we're going to continue uh, by talking about how uh, firms end up being price takers in a perfectly competitive market. To understand why firms in a perfectly competitive market must be price takers, uh, let's consider a hypothetical uh, which will illustrate why this must be the case. Suppose that a, any given uh, price emerges in the market. Um, in a perfectly competitive market, the claim is that uh, the, uh, any, any one of the large number of firms must take this price as given and cannot charge a price that is any different than this emerging price. Uh, to see why, first note that no firm has an incentive to sell at a lower price than the one that emerges in a market. This is because this doing so can only hurt the firm. Instead of selling at a lower price, it could just sell at the market price and thereby uh, increase its rhetoric uh, compared to the situation uh, where uh, it would be charging a lower price. So the firm has no incentive to sell at a lower price than the price that might emerge in a perfectly competitive market. Now, uh, why is it though that a firm has no incentives uh, to increase its price rather than decrease it? Uh, well, if a firm were to increase its price and there was a uh, market price that emerged in the market already, uh, since buyers know of all of the uh, existing prices in 
they would seek out the firm that is offering uh, the good at the lowest price and go and purchase uh, the products from it. Therefore, um, any given firm will tend to drive customers away by increasing its price relative to the market price. And therefore, no firm has any incentive to increase its price above the market price. This basically means that uh, none of the firms in a perfectly competitive market can de deviate away from a price that emerges in the market. Does this mean that none of the firms that we observe in the uh, perfectly competitive market make any decisions whatsoever in the market? Are they just mechanical um, objects that uh, supply uh, the market? That's not entirely true. Because in a, even in a perfectly competitive market, uh, given any market price, each firm has to make a decision as to how many of the products to produce. Uh, and that decision is, as usual, guided by the marginal costs that the firm uh, receives. Uh, and uh, the firm will continue producing up to the point where its marginal cost increases to uh, to the point where it equals uh, the price uh, that emerges in the market. So uh, we can use this information and uh, aggregate the supply responses of each firm in the market to get an aggregate supply curve. Once we have this supply curve, we can intersect it with the demand curve, as you have learned in your previous lectures, to obtain an equilibrium point uh, that describes the equilibrium quantity and price that will be sold in a perfectly competitive market. And you've seen this picture many, many times now. Uh, you have a downward sloping demand curve, upward sloping supply curve. The point at which they intersect gives us the equilibrium price and quantity. Now, of course, the question uh, becomes whether this equilibrium that uh, we obtain in a perfectly competitive market has any special properties? The answer to that question is yes, and we're going to be discussing uh, what the properties of a perfectly competitive market equilibrium might be next. To understand the properties of the uh, perfectly uh, competitive market equilibrium, uh, we can use uh, the measures that we're used to um, analyzing, namely consumer surplus, producer surplus, and total surplus, and see um, how these look like in a perfectly competitive market and how they tend to look like when we move away from a perfectly competitive market. So first, um, let's note that uh, when uh, we have a perfectly competitive market, uh, consumer surplus and producer surplus uh, will be given uh, by the um, red and blue triangles uh, in this um, figure, respectively. And total surplus will be simply the aggregate of those two, two measures. That's how we get to total surplus. Um, and um, what we want to do is compare uh, this measure, this total surplus that we get in the perfectly competitive uh, market uh, to total surplus uh, that we might get uh, when we have a different pricing quantity that emerges. Now, uh, to illustrate um, how um, this total surplus, uh, how total surplus might differ in such circumstances, let's consider a price that is below the equilibrium price. Um, this is, uh, th this can be just, this approach can be justified, for instance, by the existence of a price ceiling that is imposed by the government, uh, which will artificially tend to push the price that emerges in an otherwise perfectly competitive market uh, downwards. So in such cases, um, the price ceiling, which is below the perfectly competitive uh, price, uh, will simply um, eliminate, ban uh, the charging of the uh, perfectly competitive price, and therefore um, the price that emerges in the market will be simply the price ceiling itself. Now, um, uh, the firms that uh, operate in this market will only be able to uh, produce uh, the amount, uh, the quantity, which is denoted as Q cleared in this figure, uh, because uh, beyond that point, their marginal costs exceed uh, the price ceiling. So the production will be given uh, by Q cleared, and the price will be given by 
uh, ceiling over here. Um, and as a result, um, the yellow area will emerge as consumer surplus, and the blue area will emerge as producer surplus. Note that uh, in the perfectly competitive market, uh, the sum of consumer and total surplus would have also included this triangular, white triangular area, uh, which covers the region between Q cleared and Q competitive. Uh, these, um, uh, this triangle is no longer included in total surplus, simply because the quantities between Q cleared and Q competitive are not being sold in this market due to the existence of a price ceiling, which causes producers to produce fewer goods than they would have in the perfectly competitive market. So this basically is meant to illustrate how a price that differs from the perfectly competitive market price can cause uh, reductions in uh, total surplus um, and also um, may have other distortions as well, such as um, uh, changing the amount of the surplus that goes to the producer uh, versus the consumer. And these effects can also be studied separately. Um, but a general point that we get is that deviations from the equilibrium cause a reduction in total welfare and um, other distortions, such as uh, the imposition of per unit taxes, uh, cause similar reductions in total surplus. These examples are often used to illustrate how interferences with the functioning of a perfectly competitive market can cause reductions in wealth. But um, as we noted, uh, there are several assumptions that need to hold for a market to be perfectly competitive. You might ask how likely it is for all of these assumptions to hold. Recall that these assumptions include uh, that the uh, products in the market must be all homogenous. There's say, no uh, differentiation. In the product. There must be a very large number of firms. Uh, there must be no barriers to entry and uh, there must be perfect in, uh, information uh, in the market. So uh, it is highly unlikely uh, for these uh, assumptions to hold, um, let alone hold all together all at once. Uh, and as we noted, uh, therefore, perfect competition, the perfect competition model is simply a useful model that lies at one of, end of the spectrum. Uh, now we're going to be looking at the other end of the spectrum uh, by focusing on monopolies. Okay, so to start our discussion of monopolies, let's first ask what a monopoly is. Um, basically, uh, the definition of a monopolist is a single seller. Uh, so when we talk about monopolistic decision making, we're talking about how uh, this single seller in a particular market would tend to make decisions. Um, but note that we're using this uh, simply as um, one end of the spectrum, uh, but the uh, logic that we're going to see uh, behind the decision-making of a monopolist uh, will guide us in understanding uh, the decision-making process behind any firm. So this is quite useful um, for the dynamics that we're going to be presenting in this section are quite useful for purpose of understanding the decision-making processes of other uh, firms as well, firms who are not monopolists. Now, a question that we want to ask immediately is why we cannot use the perfect competition model to study monopolistic behavior. Uh, the primary reason for this is that the single seller uh, can increase the price of its goods. Uh, and uh, when, when it does so, it does not face the threat of buyers uh, going to other sellers to purchase the products uh, from them simply because there are no other producers in this market. We're talking about a single seller. So therefore, uh, buyers do not have other options. And uh, so the monopolist, the single seller in the market, does not face the same pressures as the firms uh, in the perfectly competitive market do. So under these circumstances, uh, we want to ask, uh, how does a monopolist choose how much to produce and sell? Now, to answer this question, 
uh, we're going to make a more general observation. Uh, the general observation is that when making a decision, one will choose uh, that action which equalizes uh, his marginal benefit, his marginal cost. To illustrate this point, let's take a simpler example than uh, a monopolist. Uh, let's think about a student who is trying to decide or who is uh, making a decision as to how much uh, time to spend on uh, preparation for an exam. So on the horizontal axis in this graph, we're going to have hours spent on preparing for an exam. Uh, and on the vertical axis, we're going to have benefits. Now we have an upward sloping um, curve over here, which unsurprisingly uh, is meant to illustrate the marginal psychic uh, and other costs associated with studying as a function of the amount of time the student spends. So for instance, um, at eight hours, uh, let's suppose the student can no longer study because after studying for eight hours, the person simply is shut down. Um, and uh, up to that point, uh, the marginal uh, cost associated with studying is increasing. On the other hand, we have a downward sloping curve, which is meant to illustrate the marginal benefit from studying uh, in the form of an expected increase in one's grade. In fact, the way uh, I've drawn this curve um, highlights the fact that after studying for six hours, the person's marginal benefit from studying is negative, which means that the person worsens his grade by studying. Now, how much time should this student send, spend in preparing for this particular exam? Well, uh, the exact amount at which these two curves intersect, and that happens to be at five hours. Why is it the case, though, that uh, the student wants to spend exactly that much time? Uh, to see this, let's consider any other amount of time that the student might spend. So, for instance, if we go to the left of five here, say four hours, uh, we see that the marginal benefit from studying exceeds the marginal cost from studying. So, by spending an additional hour, the student gains more than what he would lose by studying and therefore uh, wants to study more. When we go to the right, it's the opposite. The marginal cost exceeds the marginal benefit. Therefore, the student has overstudied and uh, he should have studied less. This simple principle that guides the behavior of the student in deciding how much uh, time to spend on preparing for an exam guides also the monopolist's um, behavior um, when uh, it's trying to decide how much to produce in this, uh, in this monopolistic um, market. Um, and um, what we need to do uh, is simply to switch the marginal costs and benefits uh, from those that are obtained for, from studying uh, with uh, the marginal costs and benefits that the monopolist obtains by producing uh, more or less uh, of a good. So in order to um, do that, uh, we're just going to use the marginal cost curve that the, um, sub, uh, that the monopolist faces in production. And for its marginal benefit, we're going to use um, its marginal revenue. So instead of using benefits, we're going to be talking about revenue. Why? Because that is simply the income of the monopolist. Uh, and its choice of output affects that um, in, in income. Uh, and we're going to um, call... Uh, the degree to which an incremental decision affects this income, the marginal revenue of um, uh, associated with a particular uh, unit of production. Um, so, and we're going to treat marginal revenue the same way that we treated marginal benefits in the, in the student exam. So, um, when we put these on a graph, they're going to look like this. Um, the monopolist faces a marginal cost curve. It knows what its marginal cost curve like. And uh, for the benefit side, for the revenue side, it simply needs to um, know the demand curve, which tells it how many uh, units it can so sell at a particular price. And the product of those two things, the price and the quantity, will give it its revenue. So by changing uh, the quantity that it produces, it changes the size of this rectangle, which basically uh, it illustrates the uh, price times quantity and therefore the revenue that the monopolist obtains. So moving along this demand curve changes 
the size of this rectangle uh, and uh, therefore changes the uh, size of the, or changes the revenue that the monotonist um, collects. How much, uh, how does this uh, rectangle um, change uh, in terms of its size? Well, it changes according to this marginal revenue curve over here, which we obtain by tracking uh, the exact changes that are experienced in this, um, in this um, uh, rectangular area, which symbolizes, um, which depicts revenue. Now, one might ask, of course, why the marginal revenue curve uh, is downward sloping. That follows immediately from the fact that the demand curve is downward sloping. That is to say, the monopolist has to reduce the sales price in order to increase the number of goods it can sell. And that means that from each additional product that it sells, it obtains a lower and lower uh, amount from its customers, namely a lower and lower price from its customers. Um, now, this explanation is um, rather mathematical. Uh, we're talking about the way the size of the rectangular shape that illustrates revenue changes and so on. So sometimes uh, people are more comfortable uh, by thinking about um, pricing decisions and how this affects the size of that rectangular area which illustrates the revenue, rather than thinking uh, in terms of the marginal revenue curve that uh, illustrated through this example that we had. So um, when we think about pricing adjustments done by a monopolist, we can basically think of it in the following terms. Um, an increase in the price that a monopolist charges increases its margin for each sale. Margin basically refers to the price that the um, monopolist gets to charge, which is the amount that it receives from each good sold minus the costs, the marginal costs that it incurs to produce that particular yield. So that would be the margin uh, of each um, good sold. And that margin is increasing as we increase um, the price. Uh, but this uh, reduces the number of goods sold in turn because uh, the, the demand curve is downward sloping. So the monopolist basically uh, faces a trade-off uh, between these two uh, effects. Uh, it wants to increase its margin, but it also wants to increase the number of goods sold because both of these considerations affect uh, the profits that it makes. Now, what we want to do is illustrate this idea graphically. To do so, consider a monopolist who's charging a relatively low price. Uh, and in that case, um, we can calculate the profit that this monopolist makes by looking at the price that it's charging minus the marginal cost of each um, unit being produced, which uh, we have assumed in this example to simplify the analysis uh, to be constant. So the marginal cost curve is flat because the marginal cost for each unit is constant. So in order to calculate the profit, uh, we're just going to look at the difference between the price and the marginal cost, the marginal cost uh, which would give us uh, the height of this rectangular area here. That's the margin that the monopolist collects from each unit sold. But this needs to be multiplied by the number of units sold because the monopolist is not selling simply one product, but uh, it's selling all of the units that are in this market, uh, namely Q. Therefore, we want to multiply the difference between P and MC, which is the height of the uh, rectangular area here, uh, with the quantity, which is the base of this rectangular area here. So when we multiply that, we get this area, this blue area, which I've titled profit one. Now, suppose that the monopolist is contemplating an increase in price and wants to figure out what that would do to its profits, which is the thing that it's trying to maximize. Now, suppose that um, monopolist increases its price uh, to this level over here. Uh, that, of course, um, increases the uh, margin that it collects off of each unit, which is now a, uh, represented by an even taller height here. The difference between P and MC is greater than it used to be. So the margin has increased, as we have explained previously. But the quantity that it gets to sell has decreased. So there's an increase in one dimension, but a reduction in the other. 
uh, the monopolist faces a trade-off. In this case, it appears as if this move from a lower price to a higher price benefits uh, the monopolist because the yellow rectangular area appears to be greater than the blue rectangular area, which means its profit is greater. So a price increase uh, from the initial price to the current price has increased the monopolist's profits. If uh, the monopoly has profitably increased its price, let's ask whether it can continue to do so. Uh, in order to do that, let's ask what would happen if the monopolist increased its price even further. Again, the margin that it collects off of each unit has gone up, but the quantity has gone down. Uh, in this case, uh, it has led to a new profit, which is represented by the purple area, uh, and which is called profit free. Again, it appears as if uh, the purple area is smaller than the yellow area here, uh, which indicates that uh, the profit has declined. So the first price increase was beneficial because it increased the, the uh, increase in the margin effect, dominated the reduction in the quantity effect. But the second price increase uh, turns out to have um, harmed uh, the monopolist because the increase in the margin effect was dominated by uh, the reduction in quantity effect. So by doing this, the monopolist finds the point at which it maximizes its profit and that uh, uh, turns out to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, now, surprise, uh, surprise, this um, solution where we have the uh, where the monopolist um, ends up maximizing its uh, profit uh, corresponds to that point where the marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve because profits are increasing up to the point uh, where the marginal revenue uh, intersects the marginal cost curve because up to that point, you're getting more and more revenue into the firm uh, compared to the cost uh, that you're incurring in order to get that. So for that reason, these two methods always yield the same result. Uh, where the marginal revenue curve intersects the marginal cost curve, you're going to have uh, the maximum area uh, that you can possibly get, which, um, which corresponds to profit. OK, so far we've looked at how uh, a monopolist chooses its, uh, chooses its uh, production uh, and why it does so. Uh, and specifically, we noted that um, it chooses its quantity at the level where marginal revenue uh, from production increased, uh, is equalized uh, to the marginal cost associated with production. And it does so because this tends to maximize its profit. Now, this is a, a completely descriptive analysis in that it tells us what a monopolist does. But it tells us nothing about whether the behavior of the monopolist is desirable. In order to figure out whether there might be losses associated with monopolist decisions, one exercise that is often conducted is to compare uh, the welfare consequences associated with the monopolistic market with the uh, welfare consequences associated with a perfectly competitive market. The idea here is to illustrate how a move from a perfectly competitive market towards a monopolistic market may affect wealth. In order to do that, what we do is first identify uh, the price and quantity that would emerge in a perfectly competitive market. These are given by PC and QC in our particular example. And um, if these prices and quantities were to emerge, if this price and quantity were to emerge in the market, uh, the total surplus uh, associated with that market would be given by this yellow triangular area. However, as we've just seen, the monopolist does not produce this quantity because it wants to increase its price, reduce its quantity, and maximize its profit. This means that uh, the units between QM and QC are sold in the perfectly competitive market are not sold in uh, the monopolistic market. Therefore, the surplus that would have been obtained from those units in the perfectly competitive market are not obtained in the monopolistic market. We illustrate this fact by highlighting uh, the surplus that corresponds uh, to those units uh, with, with blue, uh, 
Uh, and this area basically tells us the difference between total surplus obtained in the perfectly competitive market and the monopolistic market. We call this difference deadweight loss, uh, which is meant to illustrate the total losses associated with moving from a perfectly competitive market to a monopolistic market. It is important to note uh, at this point uh, that we've been using the perfectly competitive um, market and the monopolistic market um, as, as um, points uh, on a spectrum of potential settings in which a firm may make decisions. Reality often lies in between these two points. Uh, and therefore, uh, the idea is to interpret moves towards the monopolistic market as, um, uh, as generating losses in the form of deadweight loss, uh, because uh, such moves and to increase the price above the marginal cost and thereby uh, lead to fewer units being sold, which, uh, as we just noted, um, uh, generate deadweight loss. But even this generalization is often incorrect um, because there are other dynamic factors that uh, may reverse this conclusion. For instance, um, we may have a firm which outcompetes its rivals by inventing superior products. And uh, this may subsequently increase its market power. In fact, uh, just for the sake of a hypothetical, we may assume uh, that uh, this move, uh, this, uh, this invention of the superior product completely pushes all rivals away, in which case uh, the firm would be a monopolist. Now, is this move a bad thing or a good thing? Uh, well, if the invented superior product uh, is so good that it pushes the other firms away, uh, this is presumably because it leads to um, welfare gains on the side of the consumers who like this product significantly more than the previously existing products. And that is why uh, this move can be uh, welfare enhancing, despite the fact that it reduces the numbers, number of firms that exist in this particular market. So, um, therefore, it's important uh, to um, highlight the fact that um, these two models that we have been studying are endpoints, and we generally are in a point in between these two endpoints. Uh, so, uh, for this reason, simply looking at by how much the price is above marginal cost. Uh, will tend to give us insufficient information about the degree of competition in a market. There will be very specific circumstances to each market which will affect the competitive pressures that exist. Therefore, um, many antitrust analyses question whether a particular type of firm conduct will tend to increase or decrease well. Uh, we've already given um, the example of inventions potentially leading to a uh, fewer uh, number of firms in the market, uh, but um, may nevertheless increase welfare. Uh, but another bad type of conduct, for instance, uh, can be the um, uh, can can take the form of a territorial restriction, where um, some firms exit a particular territory to leave it to uh, a lower number of firms, uh, which tends to increase their profits jointly, but harms um, the um, uh, well-being of consumers and thereby leads to a reduction in consumer welfare. So, um, in conclusion, we have looked at the perfectly competitive uh, market and monopolistic behavior models, uh, and uh, these models are useful for understanding how firms behave when they face different market conditions. And uh, it is also uh, illustrative of the fact that regardless of which circumstance we are looking at, firms tend to equate their marginal revenue uh, to marginal costs. But uh, depending on uh, the type of environment uh, the firm finds itself in, the calculation of the marginal revenue uh, differs. For instance, in the perfectly competitive market, marginal revenue simply equals the price that emerges in the market. But in the context of uh, the monop in the context of monopolistic decision making, as we've seen, the marginal revenue takes the form of a change in profit uh, that that is tracked by looking at the downward sloping demand curve. 
So um, environments matter for purposes of uh, figuring out how uh, firms respond, uh, how firms make their production decisions. And therefore, um, the dynamics that we've seen, especially in the context of monopolistic decision making, will be useful for purposes of studying other uh, contexts as well. And um, we've also uh, done a quick analysis of how uh, increases in price and reductions in quantity may tend to harm welfare. Uh, but we noted that these are static changes and that uh, in reality, there will often be dynamic effects uh, or dynamic considerations such as the existing existence of inventions and so on that will change the way we may look at uh, particular conduct. So um, these models are basically meant to give you building blocks to understand um, firm uh, decision making. Uh, and these will be useful uh, for you in understanding the way firms behave in other more realistic contexts. Thank you very much.